Yeah, so we're going to head over to Samantha Mo, and she's a certified parent coach, and she'll give us lots of wisdom, and I'm sure you have <laughs> lots of questions for her at the end and stuff. We'll try to stump her as much as we can. Mm, but anyway, um, let's give her a big warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Raise your hand if you thought parenting was going to bring more love and joy into your life. <laughs> okay, so raise your hand if actually you wish sometimes you could go back to what life was like before you had kids. It's kind of a paradox, right? Like it's nice to have kids, not so nice to have kids sometimes. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about some ways that can bring more peace and joy into your household. Um, Jen and I have known each other for a few years. I've been speaking um, at different events for prayer care maybe for four years or so. Um, and this tends to be a popular topic. Um, I am the owner of a parent coaching agency called Mad to Glad in St. Paul. And um, I became a certified parent coach in 2011. So I want to share a story with you about a family who came in to see me whose daughter was named Rachel. Now, Rachel's parents came in to see me several years ago saying that Rachel is out of control. She needs to rule the roost. She won't do things unless it's, his, unless it's her idea. And she has tantrums if we ask her to do something, and she wants it to go her way instead of our way. So mom said, you know, I've tried a lot of tools, I've read a lot of books, and it really feels like we're just in survival mode at home. In fact, when I wake up in the morning, my daughter has so many tantrums that I feel anxious not knowing how the day is going to go. She said the other day I wanted to help her get ready. She's five years old. I had the hairbrush. I was going to fix her hair. And I said, come over here, let me help you. And Rachel ran away screaming again. And I was just at the end of my rope. So I threw the hairbrush down on the floor so hard that it broke. And that's when I knew I was in trouble. She said, more often than not, I found myself locking the door behind me in my bedroom, calling my husband at work saying, you need to come home and get our seven-year-old daughter on the bus because I can't do this. So when Rachel's dad chimed in, he said, you know, I want to be compassionate, but when a child puts this behavior in your face over and over again, the only thing I know how to do is to get sterner and to get louder, and I've become this angry dad, though I was never an angry guy. He said, I'm consumed by what's going on at home so deeply that I had to switch my work schedule so that I can be at home to get both girls on the bus in the morning. And... Um, that means I don't get to be at home for dinner, so we just don't feel like we get that quality family time that we're looking for. Well, fast forward to a few months later, I'm meeting with her parents, and um, Rachel's mom starts by saying, we found the pathway out of crisis. We feel like a regular family. Of course, there's bumps in the road, but she said, when I wake up in the morning, I feel confident that I have the tools to handle any situation. Now, this is big news because Rachel had extreme anxiety and a sensory processing disorder. So by nature, she was a bit unpredictable. When her husband chimed in, he said, what's really great is because my wife has these tools, I can actually bike to work in the morning before the girls even wake up, meaning I can get home in time for dinner and have dance parties with the girls afterward and be the fun dad that I've always wanted to be. I think the missing piece was understanding what was going on in Rachel's brain, causing her to behave the way that they do. So we're going to dig into some of what's going on in your kids' brains tonight to um, shed some light on why they behave the way that they do. So um, I actually started my career as a speech pathologist in 2004. I have my master's degree in communication disorders, and I worked at a school for kids with autism. And um, after working with hundreds of families and hundreds of these kids, there was really one catalyst on my caseload who made me want to dig deeper into the brain science. And his name was Charlie, a very innocent looking eight-year-old boy. So when I was trying to bring Charlie from the computer lab to my speech therapy office one day, Charlie had a meltdown, which was really par for the course. But this meltdown didn't happen just anywhere. It happened in the middle of the hallway, right outside the cafeteria at high noon, which meant that while he's laying there on the floor screaming, I hate this, I want to go back, this is stupid. Have you heard some of those words before from your kids? <laughs> when I was looking at him with sweat dripping down my back, I thought, even with a six-year degree, I have no idea what to do here. 
and I could feel the eyes of half a dozen teachers looking out the doors of the cafeteria, and I could imagine they were judging, what is she going to do? What is she not going to do? Eventually, I'm embarrassed to say, I bribed Charlie and brought him back to the computer lab, and we didn't have speech therapy that day. When I went back into my office, I put my head in my hands, and I thought, maybe I chose the wrong job. It's something I hear from parents pretty consistently once you're working with kids in these challenging moments. And so what this did for me is I thought there must be some information. If I could dig deeper, there must be some answers that traditional studies didn't teach me so that I could get through to Charlie because I inherently believe that all kids have gifts. And it's a matter of accessing them. So I spent hours digging into the research of um, neuroscience into child development and the science of mindfulness. And what happened was I got to this point where I thought, man, there's something I'm not seeing. I know it's right under my nose, but what is it so I can give this kid the life that I think he deserves to have? And I wanted to give up, but finally one day I found the pattern. It was the thing that changed everything in my work. And it was this, the answers are in the brain. A child who's having challenging behaviors needs two things. The brain needs to feel calm, and the brain needs to feel safe. All other strategies you try to tack on, if we haven't nailed these two critical pieces, are going to be done in vain, and they will drain your energy and probably make you feel frustrated. So in order to give you some keys for unlocking a little bit more joy in your parent-child relationship tonight, um, I want to get a little bit geeky about the brain science. And then we actually are going to talk about an overview of eight pillars of things you can implement at home in order to help your kid connect and make things more peaceful. Um, so to give you a little bit of context of what we're going to cover tonight, I actually created a program that is called the Mad to Glad Blueprint that teaches over eight weeks these pillars of parenting. So please know we won't be able to answer all of your questions tonight, but I hope to give you something that will get you started and give you some hope that if you're feeling stuck, there's a better way of doing things. Now, John Lennon, oops, John Lennon is famous for saying, all you need is love. You remember that song? All you need is love. And as a new grad out of school um, 13 years ago, I wished that was the case. As an idealist, I thought, yeah, if all you needed was love, I was going to be golden. But what I found was that, unfortunately, there are more ingredients that are necessary when you're raising children, particularly when they have challenging behaviors. We also need skills. So that's really the crux of the eight pillars that you're going to learn tonight are the skills that transform families from mad to glad. All right. So... Um, I want to learn, oopsies, a little bit more about you guys before I keep moving on here. I know we have some professionals in the group. So raise your hand if you're here for continuing education, you're a professional. Okay, great, thank you. And I'm going to ask you simple questions about how old your kids are, and then I'm going to go a little bit deeper and ask you why you chose to be a parent in the first place. So start thinking about that question. We're going to create a list. So raise your hand if you have a child the, between the ages of zero and three right now. Okay, got it. And if you have kids ages four to seven, okay, quite a few, at least 50%. Ages eight to 12, ooh, even more, 70%. Um, 13 to 17, okay, got it. And then 18 or older, <coughs> okay, are you a grandparent? Anybody a grandparent in here? You don't have to raise your, oh, proudly, thank you, I love it. Great, so you might be surprised to hear that every single one of you is gonna learn something tonight because we're taking the, this bigger perspective of the brain, so you will have something valuable before we leave. So now let's go into the question that might not be as simple, which is why you decided to have kids in the first place. So let's see if we can get 10 or so ideas and I'm just gonna jot them down. So you get to shout them out because we're in a school, so. That's what happens sometimes. Who's going to kick us off? I was a teacher. I'm not afraid. Okay, you guys smiled first. Why did you guys decide to have kids? Because you wanted them. Yep, that's a great answer. That's very positive. Yep. Okay, why else did you guys, anybody else, other people, why did you decide to have kids? Yes.
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So really to it <laughs> So I'm going to write partnership. Just working together with your partner after having your dog. We had a dog. They were a good trial run. Okay. Good. What else? Unconditional love. Unconditional love for you to provide or receive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll hear a little bit tonight. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Good. Okay, what else? Parenthood. Say that again? Parenthood. To experience what is parenthood. Just to experience parenthood. Yep, got it. Okay, what else? We've got a few more that people usually say. Let's see if they're inside your brains, too. Fun, share the joy. Yeah. Fun, share the joy. Great. Okay, so who had, raise your hand if you had a really good childhood experience and you wanted to repeat that for a child. Yeah, good. Repeat the good. Now, don't worry, I'm getting to the other half of you. <laughs> Which ones of you wanted to do parently differently after how you were raised? Okay, I'll, okay, you don't have to hold them that high, don't worry. Maybe do a little bit of repair. Okay, anybody in here thought, having kids would bring some healing into their lives? That's usually a common one. I only hear, see a little bit of raised eyebrows, so maybe not as common. Okay, is there anything that I missed? Biology. Biology? So that it just happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that, yep. Thank you. Hey. I've talked to hundreds of parents, and so that one still comes up. All right, anything else somebody wants to add? Yes? I think some kind of like companionship um, when you're old. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That comes up a lot too. Great. Companionship for when you're old. All right, so now that's why we wanted to have kids. And then you had kids. And so what are the things that make you question, why did we have kids in the first place? What are some of the behaviors that are draining? Say that again. Just like I made you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yep. Okay. So repeating yourself makes it frustrating and maybe question why you had kids. No personal time. No personal time, yep. What else? Lack of sleep. <laughs> well, that leads to all of us having behaviors. Okay. We'll say challenges associated with having kids. What else? Stress. Stress. Okay. Well, all right. But let's really be honest here. What are the behaviors that drive you nuts? Not listening. Kicking, not listening. <laughs> yeah. Bickering. Now we're on a roll. <laughs> Kicking. More, more. Mine, messy. My handwriting gets worse and worse. Say that again? Yo, oh, yeah, back talk. Whew. Back talk, manipulation. Okay, so usually once we get on a roll, this list starts turning like this. We've got like all these different things. Okay, cool. So now that we're on the same page here. Um, let's look at, when you consider this side, how does that feel to you as a parent? You don't have to actually answer this out loud, but, out loud, but just notice when you look at all of these things, it tends to be like rosy and lovely and maybe give you <coughs> like a breath of relief, like, oh, isn't that so nice? And then when you look at this side, something different happens in your body, am I right? Right? You can live into that pretty quickly. So... Um, we're going to dive into the brain to give you some answers immediately for how to shift these behaviors because then we can bring some more peace and joy into your family. All right, so let me get my clicker. So this new perspective is valuable, especially when you're a parent who really cares to learn more about what you can do to be better as a parent because um, 
it, it just gives you a bigger picture for understanding why things you try will work and why they won't work. And it comes back to the brain here. So we know we have a downstairs brain that's responsible for the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. And this is very early developing in the brain when we were um, living in primitive conditions like in a cave or in a teepee. This was important to keep us safe. So if a bear was chasing us in the woods, our brain would trigger adrenaline and cortisol and stress chemistry, and it would cause us to run and keep ourselves safe, okay? If you have a fight response. If you have um, a flight response, actually, if you have a freeze response, it might make you blend into the wallpaper if there was tension in your family. And we want to compare this to the upstairs brain that's responsible for higher cognitive skills like problem solving, paying attention, and managing behaviors. So when Charlie is laying on the floor like a pancake, screaming, and I'm sweating, if I try to pull from my problem solving kit and I say, ooh, Charlie, what could we do here instead of screaming right now? Do you think that's going to be very effective? No, obviously not. Or um, in the autism and ADHD world, we, come, we consistently say, like, look at me when I'm talking to you. But when he's in that mode, it's not going to help. Or we try to use some really cool behavioral management tools like breathing and glitter balls so kids can look at this and then as the glitter settles, their brains can settle and they can feel less stressed. But the chances of that working with Charlie when he's in that super intense mode, they can be slim when you're at home. They can be slim if you're in a school setting too. And so what we want to do is we want to understand that the brain is on fire. Because when we understand the brain is on fire, it gives us a new perspective of what we can do instead. And the first line of order is not adding fuel to the fire. So because you're here at a parenting talk, the catch tonight is I'm actually not going to walk you through a list of 10 steps to de-escalate behaviors. I'm going to give you strategies to catch the fire in your brain. And I'll tell you why. Um, because when the brain is on fire, we get into this power struggle where um, we want to win, we become controlling, we dig in our heels, sometimes we, come, we become aggressive or violent, and the same thing is true for our kids. So we're learning how we can shift this intense brain, this fiery brain, um, because <laughs> if we don't learn this, instead of helping kids co-regulate and learn the skills to calm down, we cause them to co-escalate. So what happens, oopsies, what happens, let's say I'm walking along this neural pathway, and this just means I am reinforcing the screaming behavior. So I say something like, Charlie, we shouldn't be doing that right now. Charlie, knock it off. If, we, if I start escalating, there's like a scientist in the brain that's gathering the data, and it says, oh, ding, that's what I needed. I needed attention. So we just flooded the brain with more stress chemicals, which feels like a shot of espresso to kids. We're like, whoa, even though it harms your relationship. And even if later they're crying and they're saying, I'm, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to say those mean things. They're not in control because the brain is becoming wired to uh, meet your intensity if you're matching it. It's kind of like a gambler who has their hand on a slot machine this little scientist, testing to see, will I win this time? How about this time? And these patterns become really deeply ingrained, and they're powerful at influencing kids' personalities. So what kids learn whenever we reinforce that behavior is that the best way to get your attention needs met and for you to feel heard by me is through resistance and defiance and disrespect. So what do we do? Obviously, um, we need tools. And we want to understand that this fire in the brain behavior is showing a message. It's showing Charlie saying, I don't know how to handle this, the fact that I want to be in the computer lab, other than dropping on the floor. I can't calm down, because as Ross Green says, if your child could be good, they would. And what I see when a child is melting down is I need help because if he had the tools, he would be able to help himself. So knowing that we all need tools, um, 
if we want to stop the cycle, we want to learn how do we first take a step back and calm the fire in our brain. Even though you might be feeling homicidal, like you, how do we calm that fire? And I recommend a mantra, oops, it's not here. I recommend a mantra, calm body, calm voice, calm face. Now this mantra is so popular that we made magnets out of them. And just for you guys coming here tonight, it's your gift. So before you leave, just on that side table over there, be sure to grab one of these. Because when you can learn how to pause and teach your body to calm down, you now have mirror neurons kicking in the brain, which reflect the state that other people are in. So you're giving your child an opportunity to learn how to regulate based on your calm. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm going to give you an experience of calm. The first pillar is calm the fire. But to give you an experience, we're going to watch a little video here. I get really mad when my brother hits me a lot. I don't like it when you say you don't want to play with me. When I'm mad, my brain can get a headache and it can start hurting. Your blood keeps pumping because you're like really mad. And you start to get sweaty because you're getting really, really mad. And then when you start getting really mad, you turn red. When your body can't really control yourself, and that just takes over your body. I just get out of control. <coughs> it's kind of like if you had a jar, and then the jar would be your brain, and then you put glitter in the jar, and that would be on your brain. If you shook up the jar and the glitter went everywhere, that would be how your mind looks. And it's like spinning around, and then you don't have any time to think. And you sometimes punch stuff and people when you don't really mean it. When I get angry, I feel it in my heart. I really don't like when I get angry. The amygdala really reacts, but the prefrontal cortex tries to <clears throat> keep it down. So take a moment and just notice what it feels like in your body as you even watch people breathing. Because when our brain is on fire, we're usually breathing really shallow rather than that deep breath. And we can't access our own problem solving skills to get us out of the situation. So pay attention to that feeling because we're going to compare that with a different feeling next.
So in order to really create change at home, we have to know how to calm the fire. And I trust that you guys have heard techniques that you can use at home, but um, I'm going to go against um, popular belief and say information isn't the key to transformation because um, we've all learned different diets and exercise routines, and the key is taking action. And when you can take action to calm the fire in your brain, whether that is a mantra or taking a breath or walking away rather than matching fire, you're now cr nurturing a more positive relationship with your child. So we're going to compare this to a different feeling in the body now that you have this sense of calm. And I want to do an experiment with you of a hidden landmine that triggers stress in your brain so that you can feel what that's like in your body. So for this exercise, I want you to close your eyes. It's only going to be 30 seconds. I won't scare you. And I want you to notice what it feels like in your body as you're listening to my voice. Okay, so close your eyes now. No. No. Knock it off. Stop it. Ah, uh, don't. No. No, I said no. No. And open your eyes. Starting phrases with no is a hidden landmine that triggers fire in your child's brain. And we have these landmines that are hidden in our everyday language that we want to be aware of because they put kids into a stressed out state, meaning that that stress builds and builds throughout the day until maybe they come home and they lose it, or there's a certain type of day they just lose it, because that's been built up. There are four common body responses to this experiment. Let's see if we can capture all four. All right, so what did you notice in your body? Yes? Tense. You notice tension where? All over your body, yep. So oftentimes I'll hear that there was tension in my neck or tension in my stomach. And so kids will say things like, I can't go to school today, my tummy hurts. And you're like, this is a hypochondriac, they're never sick. But we want to consider what amount of stress they're under. Okay, what else did you notice? Loss of calm. Loss of calm. It went away, yeah. And so with your experience of loss of calm, did you feel maybe more like angry and you wanted to shut me up or more like whatever, I'm tuning you out and I just... More like this is involved in the situation. Yeah. Instead of, you know, getting angry, it's like, well, I'm just chill. Yeah. Yeah, so you just recognize that, uh-oh, this is, this is evolving into a negative situation. Do you think your kids can feel that when it's happening? Yeah, maybe sometimes right when you walk in the door. Okay. So um, anger, it, you didn't say angry at all, um, but I asked you about it. Anger is another common reaction. So we've got tension, we've got anger, and the reason for that is because with some personalities, this triggers a retaliation response of, oh, yeah, you think you're going to tell me what to do? I'm going to fight you. And then we have the reaction of just tuning me out. Whatever, not listening to this Samantha Mole lady. Raise your hand if you tune me out. It's usually like 10% of the crowd. I see two, three hands. Okay, got it. Um, and then the last one, did anybody have something different? There's one more. It's a common one. Yes. You felt ashamed. You felt ashamed. That is the exact response. And you didn't even do anything wrong. <laughs> yeah. So what happens, what I call that is the wilting response. And it tends to be people who are, have more of a pleasing personality um, where we'll see this in kids, this, this wilting response, this drooping. Even as young as five years old, they'll come home and they'll say, I got whatever you know, bad color on the behavior chart at school today. And you ask them why. And they'll say, I'm just a bad kid. So then we start thinking about what is, how is their self-esteem? How is the correction impacting their self-esteem? 
So we want to be aware of these everyday hidden landmines so that we're not contributing to the fire. Now there are actually 10 hidden landmines and we have a free report on my website and so if that's something you're interested in we have a form we'll just email it out to you tomorrow totally free because when you can become aware of this you can now practice replacing them. So I have a friend in St. Paul who's a holistic nutritionist and we were talking about sugar cravings and she's like Samantha everyone's got it all wrong they think the solution to cutting sugar cravings cravings is to just like have strong willpower and stop eating sugar but that's not it at all what you need to do is you need to add healthy fats like avocado and coconut oil and then the cravings just fall away and it's similar for these hidden landmines it's what we want to do is we want to actually replace them. So instead of telling kids what not to do, if your kid's climbing up on this shelf over here and pounding on the window, we, instead we could say things like, oh, feet on the floor, come pound on your drum, looks like you want to climb, go outside and climb on the jungle gym. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So if you're noticing that there is this stress in your household, then, of course, um, we want to shift that, not just with um, the hidden landmines, but to understand this concept of flooding the brain with happy chemicals. One of the families I worked with, her name is Bonnie, and she has five children, six children now. And she said, you know what, Samantha, you're talking about happy chemicals. And, like, I know that I need to praise my kids and play with them and give them encouragement and help them be happy. But to be honest with you, let me tell you about my schedule. I wake up at 5 a.m. so that I can walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes, so that I can shower, prepare breakfast, start waking up the kids in the proper order, get their lunches made, get them on the bus, only to go and do my household chores throughout the day, make phone calls, fill out paperwork, possibly eat lunch sitting down, preparing um, in the afternoon, running my errands, so that I'm home in time to greet them after school. And then you know what? It's snack, it's homework, it's stopping the fighting, it's dinner, um, it's struggling over screen time, and then it's fighting them to get into bed at nine o'clock so that I can fall into bed exhausted. My day is, or my world, is a world of so that I do this, so that I can do that, so that I can do that. And I share this with you to help you understand that if we are trying to raise joyful children, we have to see how busy are, are our lives and do we have a sense of joy in our lives. So I'm gonna share a story here that's new for me to share actually. Um, it's a vulnerable story. I wrote it down because I, I want to share a really important point. Because a lot of us were raised in a household where it was a stressful situation. So I was raised in a family of seven. So I have, there's five kids in my family. And um, we just grew up in Coon Rapids. My parents were strict, they were conservative. And if there was anything that was overwhelmingly clear, it was that you obey dad at all costs. Dad is in control, he doesn't adjust his expectations for your needs. And I was raised to have compassion for that. He's a high achiever who put really high expectations on himself. He worked high level management jobs, 12 and 14 hours a day, went to business school at night. But what happened was when he would come home, if I said something that was offensive or disrupted what he wanted to do, wanted to get done for the evening, he would start by yelling from across the room, charge to get in front of my face and scream in front of my face. And so what happened to me as a kid is um, this stress taught me something. It created a sense of fear and anxiety in my body. And I learned not to do things that would make dad angry. And I'm sharing this story because there's a pattern and a history that comes generationally that have influenced who we are today. That these moments can have a profound impact on us as we are adults. So I remember that um, my mom would apologize for him and talk about his stressful job and trying to feed seven, seven people. But it caused me to become a person who was quiet, who would hide. I learned to not speak up and to be invisible. I learned that if I wasn't seen or heard, I couldn't make my dad mad. And so I became an expert at hiding my feelings and going to great lengths to please other people. 
which wasn't healthy, right? So this emotional stress naturally turned into physical stress. By the time I was six years old, I wasn't able to go to the bathroom, so my mom would put bran in my cereal. As a teenager, I would black out before high school, and we didn't know why I had such severe anxiety. And then when I was 20, my weight skyrocketed to 230 pounds, and I hadn't changed my eating patterns at all. Um, so I'm sure you know what this stress feels like, either from your childhood or from your adulthood and raising kids right now. And I know that you're dealing with stresses of your own. And what I love about parent coaching is I have the opportunity to talk to parents who are willing to tell the truth about what's going on behind closed doors because they don't want to perpetuate the same patterns. It's one of the things that has gotten me over anxiety, social anxiety, and caused me to do public speaking because I, on this topic especially, because you might be surprised to find out that I'm not actually a parent. And so sometimes when parents find that out, they think, how can you relate to my situation? And I relate because I was the kid. That we have different people, we have different stories, but we all have the same emotions. Now, my dad wasn't evil. He's not a bad guy. Um, and we've had these conversations, and I forgive him for what wasn't good for me as a kid. In fact, um, his influence was really strong. As a high achiever, he taught me to create the life that I wanted and create an amazing career. But when I was 28 years old, I was really struggling. And so I went and I saw a life coach. And the life coach actually, and if you're like doubtful, I get it, I was that way too. And what she taught me to do was to embrace my feelings and learn how to process through my emotions instead of hiding and being invisible to what my actual needs were. And so as you're dealing with the stresses of your own raising kids, I want to ask you, what do you suppose your impact is on your children? What is the impact that the way you parent has on your own life? When we can think about this, we can consider shifting our behavior, but only if we're really honest. And your kids need you. So this life of so that, where um, if you're like my dad, who you don't really enjoy your everyday routine, and you come home and you're on empty yourself, it's going to be really difficult to give your kids the tools for them to be happy as well. All right. So um, thank you for letting me share that. I know there's not a quick and easy fix to parenting and to relationships. It's taken my dad and I quite a few years to develop a positive and empowered dynamic. And um, at, because you're already a parent, you know that nothing comes easy as a quick and easy fix. But I'm still hoping that when you get the context of these eight pillars, it's helping you pick and choose what am I already good at and what am I missing so you can begin including those in your parenting repertoire. All right. So as you consider um, these questions of who do I want to become as a, as a parent, you're already sitting here, you're already good parents for being here and learning and reflecting. Now we want to consider, um, am I parenting in a way that gives me energy and gives my family energy, or am I parenting in a way that's draining me and draining my family? So there's a concept that I've coined called red light parenting. And red light parenting is something where, let's say, Billy is um, playing his video game and you want him to come eat dinner. So red light parenting would be giving an instruction and then following through so that the red light goes on in the brain and the little scientist learns, oh, I have to stop right now and listen. This, of course, will give you energy. So what this might look like is you would say, Billy, come and eat. If when he doesn't listen, you would help him turn off the game. You would walk him into the kitchen or the dining area. And even if there's a meltdown, you would set this firm limit. And this type of parenting, even though you have to physically follow through, it actually gives you energy because you're teaching kids that listening is required, <coughs> that the rules apply to the kids, and that they're responsible for their own behavior. And we want to compare this with green light parenting. And green light parenting is where you give your child an instruction and the little scientist learns, oh, I can actually just keep doing what I'm doing. So what that looks like in the dinner situation is you'd say, Billy, come and eat. 
And you might even go in there and you might say, Billy, turn off, or, right, Billy, turn off your game, come and eat. But then you walk away back into the kitchen and you're like, I don't know why Billy hasn't come yet. Oh, forget it, he'll eat when he's hungry. So green light parenting um, is where your actions do not match your words. So it teaches the scientists in the brain that listening is optional. Kids learn that the rules don't apply to me and it can be a reason where you have to give the same instruction four and five times because they've only learned to listen when you really lose it. And then kids, the little scientist is also beginning to learn that somebody other than me is responsible for my behavior. So if you feel like, man, I gotta do everything for my kid, I gotta get them out of bed in the morning, I gotta dress them, sometimes I gotta put food in my kid's mouth, that might be because you're, you're doing some green light parenting. And the little scientist is an aggressive researcher, so they're gathering data. So again, even if you say, we go through this racket every single night, why don't you just listen to me? If your actions don't match your words and you're trying to go in auditorily, well, the, the listening channel is broken. So for intense kids in particular, we wanna make sure that we physically follow through. And then of course, there's somewhere kind of in the middle and there's this spectrum of red light parent, or excuse me, yellow light parenting. And with yellow light parenting, sometimes um, you do the green light style where you're like, oh, I can be flexible today. We don't have soccer practice. It's fine if he eats whenever he wants. But then other times you're like, we have soccer practice. And you run in there and you're way too aggressive. You're yelling, you're grabbing that game, you ground him from computers or games for a month. You might grab him too firmly. So yellow light parenting is the most confusing for kids because the scientist is getting intermittent reinforcement which is what makes gambling so addictive. Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't, and kids who are more intense are wired to win. So let me see if I can win this time. And so they hold out and hold out and hold out, which leads to power struggles. <coughs> so when we understand the type of parenting you're doing, it's a natural transition to talk about, okay, so depending on how you're training your kids to listen, or not listen, we want to understand what are the consequences that are coming on the other end. Because sometimes <coughs> parents will say to me, I just need better discipline. If you could just like write the book on discipline, I would be golden. But it starts before discipline, actually, um, with red light parenting and some of the other things you've already learned. So I'm curious, when you guys hear the word discipline, and I want to write these down, what do you think of? What are some of the methods you think of when you hear discipline? <coughs> Time out? Yep. Um, I'm going to write it here. Yep. What else? To teach. To teach. Yep. That is, the tran that is the root of the word discipline is to teach. Thank you. What else? Boundaries. Boundaries. Mm-hmm. And what kind of consequences do we offer, or how do we respond to kids to try to make them follow the boundaries that we've set? What are discipline modalities? You don't have to say you've done it, maybe you've read it. <laughs> take yeah, take things away. Bribery. Bribery, absolutely, that's me and Charlie. What else? Stern. Mm-hmm, stern. Yeah, like I have to be firmer and sterner. Okay, what else? That's pretty good. Okay, so in general, we're, we're often thinking of consequences that are negative when we think of the word discipline. But the truth of it, as somebody mentioned, is that the root is to teach. And the old school way of teaching discipline was this. I'm gonna draw a chart here for you to understand power balance. So our parents generation and older, before we got into conscious and intentional parenting, usually thought discipline meant this. Somebody is overpowering, so they're the controller, and the other person is disempowered and they become the victim. So I realize we didn't mention things like spanking 
And I'm remembering that because I'm picturing the lashing my, my grandparents would describe of going to pick their own switch. So discipline methods weren't a, a balance of power, right? But we're seeing that if we want to have positive relationships with kids, then when we're disciplining them, we actually want to create a power balance so that they have input. And input is especially important for the more of the strong-willed kids because they have a psychological need for control. And they won't allow themselves to be overpowered. So when you get really intense kids who are fighting you, you might feel sometimes like they're actually overpowering you and you do green light parenting because you're worn down and you've become a victim in the situation. So as you can imagine, um, discipline is a whole talk on its own. Um, you can actually look that up on my website if you want. We have that training coming in a few weeks. But I want to share that with discipline, we always want to consider, am I using some sort of red light parenting where my actions are following through with my words, and am I staying with my child? Because for kids who are more intense, they don't have the ability to hit the reset button. So when we send them away in the corner or we send them to their room, it triggers abandonment and more fire. Got it? Okay. All right, so what I want you to consider just for a moment here and jot something down on your paper, I won't ask you to share this out loud, is I want you to consider um, three things. In what situations do I empower my child? Just write one situation. What situation do I empower my child or have I recently? In what situation have I overpowered my child? And then list one situation where you have become the victim and you were disempowered with your child. So write down three examples just for self-reflection, please. And if you want to talk to your co-parent or friend or partner who came with, please feel free to do so. I'll give you about two minutes. All right, I see 80% of you are done. Great. So for creating an empowered relationship, the rule of thumb is to consider, am I giving my child some input here? So whether that's coming up with family rules, am I allowing them to give some input here? Or did I read this awesome article and I just came home and said, here's the family rules? Because to empower children, we want to be sure that we give them a voice. Okay? All right, so there's lots of reasons for power struggles at home. Some of it is, comes from pillar number one with we're matching fire with fire. Um, some of it comes from things like discipline where we're disempowering or overpowering kids. And there is even another reason. And the principle of this one has to do with um, the language that we're using with kids. So as, have you heard of, you've probably heard of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, right, by Dr. John Gray. So when I first read that book, it made total sense that men speak differently than women. So when I first got married, um, I remember cooking, 
and my husband came home and I had a really bad day and he, he walks into the kitchen and he sees me being all cold and he says, oh, tough day, huh? Buck up, tomorrow's another day. <laughs> and I was like, wow, we are, we're in our 30s. I can't believe you just said that to me. And so um, luckily he learns all of the stuff that I'm teaching and Dr. John Gray teaches. And he learned instead to come home and put his hand on my shoulder and say, oh, tough day, huh? To which I would respond with, yes, it has been so tough. I can't believe it. So doesn't it make sense that if men and women have different languages and ways of connecting, adults and children have different language and ways of connecting? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to share why. We're going to geek out on brain stuff again. So we know that the right brain is responsible for emotions, and kids zero to three exclusively experience the world from their emotional brain. And as adults, we reside in our left brain, which is responsible for logic and language. Do you know how old we are when our brains are fully developed? Yeah, yeah, 25 plus. So that means we are well into our logical brain and our kids are very far away from being able to enter that, really fully integrate all of those logic skills. So when kids get stuck here, it's not just that there's fire in the brain, but it's that they're also having these really big emotions and they don't have the developmental skills yet to sort through them. So it comes out as behavior. And luckily, we get to be the external brain to help bridge that gap and give them the language that is necessary. So we want to build that bridge. Um, so I worked with a family. Oh, yeah, so we want to use child language. So I worked with a family once, um, this kind of this side of town, Eden Prairie. And they came in to see me, and they said, you know what? Our 11-year-old Devin is just an angry kid. We've taken him. Um, to therapy, we brought him to the doctor for medication, we tried holistic routes like homeopathy and chiropractic. Incidentally, I'm married to a pediatric chiropractor, so like, I'm really listening carefully for all the things that they've tried. And really, they had tried everything for resources to help their kid. And when they um, were describing him, they said, you know, he punches holes in the wall, it's really disruptive with his sister, she's nine years old. And we feel like nothing is ever going to work, and we're just waiting for him to turn 18 and move out. All right. So obviously, that's a very dramatic example. And, um, and I said, well, tell me an example of when Devin was angry recently. And mom said, oh, I've got the perfect example. The other day, him and his sister Abby were riding the bus home from school, and I wanted to make Devin's favorite meal. Well, he's gluten-free and he's dairy-free, so I spent 45 minutes making this meal once they got home. They had downtime. And then you know what happened? I said, kids, come and eat. And Abby came running to the table and sat there sweetly, and Devin didn't. So I went into the living room. I'm like, Devin, come and eat. Your sister's waiting. And he didn't budge. So I stood right in front of him like I was taught I was supposed to do. And I said, Devin, come and eat. Your sister is waiting. And he had his arms crossed in front of his chest. And he said, I'm not eating that. I want to order pizza. And you know what mom said? Devin, we're not ordering pizza. I know this is your favorite meal. I've spent 45 minutes making this. And she said things that started escalating as she used logic. So at one point, she tried grabbing him by the arm. Um, and he grabbed the remote control next to him and threw it across the room so hard it put a hole in the door. And I said, well, what did you do? And she said, I told him, Devin, you know we're moving soon and we have an open house this weekend. People are coming to see the house. Now we're going to have to find a contractor. Contractors cost money. You haven't been doing your, your chores, so you don't have an allowance and someone's going to have to pay for this. You hear all the logic, right? You even feel it inside of you because we all use so much logic. So what we did is we focused really diligently on understanding what was the emotion Devin was experiencing outside of this little moment. And I asked her, I said, tell me more about what's going on in Devin's life. And she said, yep, I'm happy to. So like I said, we're moving, um, the month was April, we're moving at the end of the school year, and we gave the kids a choice. We said, you can move to the new school early, or you can finish out the school year at your old school. Abby decided to move to the new school early. Devin decided to finish out at the old school. 
And she said, you know, I wanted to make Devin's favorite meal because he struggles in school. He has a learning disability. He gets pulled out for remedi remediation, remedial reading. He never gets invited to birthday parties. The only reason kids like him is because he's the class clown, but even <coughs> then, he's in the principal's office twice a week. I wanted to make his favorite meal because riding the school bus home is his favorite part of the day to spend time with his sister. So when you guys hear that, what do you suppose the emotions are underneath Devin's behavior? Shout them out. Misses his sister, guilty, lost. Yep, sad. Say that again. Lonely, absolutely. Anxious, yep, what else? Someone over here? Fear. Fear, mm-hmm, yeah. We could even say angry, right? Like we could even say underneath all that, he's real angry. And so what the skill is of connecting with kids and their emotions is being able to go to them and connect with them and label how they're feeling and then stop talking. Because when you connect kids, and I've got to check this to see if it's here or not. Yes, great. When you connect kids to their emotions, it connects them to you. When you can connect kids to their emotions and then stop talking, it stimulates emotional development skills. But you have to stop talking. That's the hard part. Did you have a question or comment? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, really typical situation. I agree. So I'll play this out in this family's example so you could see. So um, the way that this typically played out for them is we identified this emotion in advance because mom couldn't think about it. Her brain was on fire in the moment. And so she said, okay, well, I think that Devin's actually, um, I think he's really annoyed because he wants to be in control of how much video game time he has. And he just feels like I'm bossing him around all the time. Like he's always on edge because he wants to be independent. So I actually think that's some of what's going on. So she practiced doing things like she would go to him and she would sit on the couch, not standing, because that actually triggers um, retaliation in intense kids. So she'd sit next to him and she'd, she'd say, hey, it's time for dinner. And he'd respond the same way, I'm not eating that. I want to order pizza. But her skill was to stay calm, to give him an opportunity to regulate, because he doesn't know how to regulate. So then she'd say, yeah, it feels like I can tell that you think that I am the one who always calls the shots, and you just want to be, you want to call the shots sometimes. And he said, yeah, why are you always bossing me around? I never get enough time to play my games. So she'd say, ugh, it's really annoying to have to be a kid sometimes, isn't it? Can you hear how we're recognizing him and giving his emotions, we're empowering the fact that he has emotions? Now, what this doesn't mean is it doesn't mean you label the emotion, stop talking, and then Devin's like, cool, thanks, Mom, I'm going to come eat dinner now. It doesn't do that at all. What happened with this family is because he felt seen, his body language would soften, and he would complain more. Oh, it's just that this and that, and I don't really want Abby to go, and da-da-da-da-da. So now they had a moment where they were able to connect, and he didn't feel like he had to fight and protect himself from being a lone wolf all the time. So that's really how it plays out. Incidentally, actually, let me say, when parents try this, inevitably I get comments after the workshop or emails later um, saying, I was skeptical. I really didn't think this could work. This sounds too simple. But if you think about the situation over here with my husband, instead of like him being a tough guy, and him connecting with me, what happened? I softened. I was like, oh, I'm not in this together. Thanks for understanding me. My emotions didn't go away. They got worse, right? <laughs> but then I had relief and a feeling of connection, and now we're in partnership, and that's what we're aiming for. We're aiming to collaborate with our kids, not just boss them around. Does that answer your question? OK, great. I was going to say, incidentally, mom came back to a workshop a couple years later, just like this. 
And she said, oh, Samantha, this workshop's been on my calendar for a month, and I got to tell you a story. Um, I know what my top three to five pillars of parenting are. Whenever we're getting into a rut, I know which ones to come back to and like refresh my skills. So about a month ago, Devin was coming home um, because this girl was really bothering him at school. And he's 13 at this time. So he comes home, and every single day, he's like, Mom, I hate this girl. She bothers me so much on the playground. She ticks me off. I saw nice little ears. Um, she ticks me off, and I just hate her, and I want to punch her in the face. And Mom's like, oh, my gosh. Every day for two weeks, he was coming home saying this. And you know how she responded was, you can't punch girls in the face. You know, now that you're getting closer to being an adult, you would go to jail if you punch girls in the face. <laughs> Don't you want girls to like you, Devin? Like, maybe, do you actually like this girl? So she's trying to use logic, and every day is coming home for two weeks. And she's like, oh, but then I saw my calendar, this workshop, and it reminded me of this pillar. And so one day he comes home, and he's talking about punching this girl in the face. And she said, I looked at him, and I said, wow. And she mirrored his body language, because he's starting firm. So she mirrored it, and she's like, wow, it sounds like that girl really ticks you off. And he says, yeah. And he said one more thing, and she's like, man, I can tell you just, and I'm using parent kid language here um, intentionally. So she's like, man, it's, it's like you hate this girl. You just cannot stand her. And she said, true to form, because they had this pattern, his body language melted. And he's like, yeah. And he walked out of the kitchen, and she comes to see me at my workshop two weeks later. And she said, guess what? After that day, he hasn't complained about this girl at all. He needed me to see him. Okay? All right. So the moral of the story is, um, especially when you're working with, when you're raising kids who are upper elementary and older, um, it's so much better to come to a point of agreement rather than arguing. Even if the agreement is, you're really ticked off and you don't want to listen right now because you think I'm bossy. That's okay. That's a better starting point than stonewalling or being aggressive. Okay? All right. So, of course, communication skills are important in any relationship. Parent-child relationship is no different. And um, equally important is daily routines. And this is a simple, I mean, this is, a, this is an obvious one. Because everybody in here, I would imagine, has heard that routines create security. And so when they're predictable, it's actually meeting those two things that the brain needs that I said at the very beginning. Do you remember what they were? Calm and safe. Yeah. So routines help kids feel safe. But the question is, what happens if we have a morning routine like Bonnie, where it's dreadful, and it includes yelling and screaming, and I can't wait to get the kids out the door. Like, that doesn't feel like it's starting the day off on the right foot. And I'm going to share um, a story, uh, Laura's story, actually, and she'll talk about her little kid. And what I want you to listen for is that when it comes to optimizing daily routines, yes, it's a matter of having the right skills and the right order and having, like, sensory needs met and rewards and some of that. Um, but with Laura, she actually needed the first six pillars of parenting in order for her routine to work. So I'm going to share this three-minute clip, and you can listen to what are some of the pillars that she needed so that she could be successful with her daughter. <coughs> Hi, I'm Laura Brown, and I have a daughter. Her name is Lauren. Can you guys hear in the back? she's had this issue for four years. It's a, a major aversion to clothing. In particular, elastics are very difficult, synthetics, um, and, and she does not have a willingness to try different types of clothes. So she chooses one pair of pants or one pair of shorts, and she has now reduced her wardrobe to three tops. By the time I contacted you, the behaviors had escalated to a point that were really unbearable for a family. She got to the point where the morning routine and just getting dressed, a very basic functional skill, would take upwards to two hours. And during that period of time, there would be cycles where she would tantrum 
for five to ten minutes, which would involve screaming, ranting, yelling, very mean phrases like, I hate you, mommy, and I don't want to be in this house, I can't stand you, you're making me do this. And then she would get quiet and act like she was ready to start again. And then meanwhile, I would engage with her. I would try to use logic and explain the importance of getting dressed and how I could help her and what she needed to do and how this was important and this is her job. And that just didn't work. Yeah. So then anywhere from one to two hours every single day just getting dressed. Yeah, and I remember in particular when you called, there was a really strong emotion that you felt. Can you remember what it felt like for you, particularly when you woke up in the morning? Um, I was just depressed. Yeah. Um, a very, very difficult time. Because my body, even though my mind would try to remain positive, physiologically, my body was not hearing that language. Yeah. I was getting sick. I was extremely nervous. I hesitated. I was so apprehensive about even putting my feet on the ground because all I could do was anticipate the same nightmare that was recurring. And it, was in, it felt like I couldn't escape it. And I think she could sense that very easily. So I just felt like we were in this downward spiral of despair and having to relive it every single day. And it was just, it was torturous. But I felt like our home had no peace, um, there, there was no calm. And then I felt, I started to feel really resentful and bitter and angry at her for choosing to be so upset about something that was so basic. But I knew fundamentally I love my child and I would do anything to help her. Yeah. But my efforts weren't, nothing I seemed to try seemed to work with her. Yeah. All right. So, did you hear some of the pillars that you've learned tonight and some of what she's saying? Maybe some of the pillars that were missing? Yes? Um, she was not using calm the fire. Yeah. How do you know? Um, I think she said she was not calm. Like, she woke up and just wasn't calm. And she tried to be positive, but her body was not reacting to that. Yeah. So she was never able to kind of be calm. Yeah. You got it. And for kids who have sensory stuff going on, um, they're in a hypervigilant state. Uh, a lot of intense kids, ADHD, uh, autism, other, so other special needs. They tend to, they're in such a hypervigilant state that they're aware of all these things going on underneath the surface especially. Kind of like um, if I'm leaving the Mall of America at 10 o'clock at night wearing my heels and if I'm walking out alone and suddenly I hear heavy plodding footsteps the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I'm aware of everything, like how far away is that? How far away is my car? I put my like, key between my fingers to protect myself. That's hypervigilance as you're like in that protective state. Um, and so Lauren was always in that state. So when Laura would come in and she'd, say, she'd be like, how are you today? From that expression, that would trigger um, the repeat of anxiety. Okay, so what else did you notice? What pillars were missing? Yeah, how do you know? You can tell by how she would explain, she would explain why it's happening rather than trying to <clears throat> diagnose where a kid is at and trying to be wherever that is. That's right. And she even had her child in occupational therapy for her sensory needs. And she hadn't, it hadn't quite sunk in yet. Oh, I have to read my kid's body and see that she needs more physical input before she can feel more positive. Great noticing. Okay, one more. What else was missing? Um, I'll share. I'll share one because it didn't actually show up in what she was saying. Um, another thing that was happening was hidden landmines. So starting phrases with no or a kid's name actually trigger fire in the brain. So she'd walk in and she'd say, all right, Lauren, we're going to have a good day today. Lauren, let's put your clothes on. Lauren, you got to get out of bed. Lauren, Lauren, Lauren. And she would repeat her name over and over again, which even as you hear that, or if you've heard like, mom, 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 10 times in five <laughs> seconds, that is way too much, right? And so I feel really grateful to share um, Laura's story, and obviously, I mean, it's on my website, so she wants people to hear this story, and I'll share, like, the flip side of 
how that shifted after I share the next pillar here so that you have a, a really complete picture. So the first seven pillars ah, are really designed to give you guys some new skills and way of considering how you want to parent your kids and create a more peaceful and happy relationship. But this eighth pillar is more about the skills that your kids need to develop. And it really has to do with conflict resolution skills. So it, it behooves all of us to get really good at understanding how do we resolve conflict in the workplace? How do we naturally resolve conflict in our partnerships? And um, break that down into, into steps so that we can teach kids conflict resolution skills, particularly instead of stepping in if your kids are fighting and saying, hey, 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 what's going on? And having them logically describe what's going on, you're going to get further if instead you step in and you say, hey, 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 what's going on? Why, it sounds like you guys need to talk about how you're feeling. I feel mad because she took this, da, 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 da. Okay, so you're mad, got it. And then you kind of navigate it on that situation so that kids learn to express how they're feeling and ask for what they need. So I want to create time for um, a spot coaching session to demonstrate how we navigate some of these skills. So if you want more information on that, again, madtoglad.com, enter sibling rivalry. You'll see a seven-minute video on step-by-steps to navigate those skills. Um, but what I do want to say is that if you want a calm house where it runs more smoothly, we have to take sibling personalities and family dynamics into account. And, and help kids learn how to navigate that because just like managing emotions, it's one thing to not manage one's own emotions and then you add in another party and it becomes even more challenging. So um, we wanna help teach kids those skills. And at the very beginning, I shared that story of Rachel's mom who threw the hairbrush down on the floor. And she said, um, I remember also in that first session, she wasn't just worried about her five-year-old or her own personal sanity, but she was worried about the impact it was gonna have on her sister. Because, you know, like many of us, we, um, we want kids to have good relationships. We want siblings to have strong relationships even when they're older and look back on their childhood and feel like they had a solid connection that was positive instead of challenging. Okay. All right. So I, I'm hoping that in your brain you can intersperse instead of parent coaching just like the pillars of parenting. To use these pillars of parenting because they're designed to bring your family from mad to glad. And like um, all families who work with me and implement these pillars, I know you're doing it because you care about your kids and you love them and you want them to be successful. And I know how much that means to you today as well as for their future so that they be can become healthy and happy adults. Um, to link what I was saying earlier, in addition to this program helping hundreds of families to find more peace, it's, learned, it's helped me learn to understand my dad and resolve some of what my childhood was, to forgive him for the things that he was not, and to open my eyes to the things that he was. We had a cabin on Mille Lacs Lake, so I remember that he would always bring us to the best fishing, or not fishing spot, swimming spot, so we could swim there all day long on Lake Mille Lacs. And we'd take fishing trips where um, we were each allowed to bring two fun-sized candy bars, which were otherwise forbidden. And so um, it really, this process opened my eyes to some of that fear and anxiety that I had been carrying with me for so long, and it allowed me to let go of it and let the good memories in. So I don't think anybody likes being in survival mode, especially when you feel like I'm going to be stuck here for the rest of my life. So I want you to know that there is something that you can do that there are lots of things that can reignite that hope inside of you. Um, if you are interested in learning more, you can just fill out the form in front of you. Holly and I can help you over here. We have breathing balls. It is such an honor to share this information with all of you tonight, to be invited by the principal, to be invited back by Prairie Care. Um, I love sharing my gifts with you guys so that you can go out and enjoy yours. So I will close it on this. My favorite Robert Frost quote is, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So I encourage you to ask yourselves, what road am I willing to take to get us where I want us to be? Thank you guys so much.